Father, thank you that every obstacle, every hurdle that has come at us this week, Father, you've given us the grace to overcome. Father, thank you. Lord God, I pray that as we enter into this day, Father, may we do so. May we do so with gratitude and joy, Father. I pray that uh, tension would start to uh, die down, Father, that we would be able to relax and just enjoy this day in your presence. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us during this discussion time, that we would learn, that we would grow, that we would be strengthened in our faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, um, we've been talking about uh, the Bible. Uh, where did it come from? Is it enough? Can we trust it? Is, is it accurate? Is it adequate? Is it, you know, does, is it what we need? So that's what we've been talking about. We've been talking about uh, one of the main reasons is because, again, yet in history and in culture, again, there's a movement underfoot to try and push us into um, departing from the Word of God and grabbing and gravitating toward a new, modern, updated version that's not just a translation update, you know, moving from ye, thou, hithersoever, old English, to ye, verily, verily, you know, to, to modern English. Um, this is more of a, a movement to embrace books in the Bible that are not in the original text. So some of the books that are, are, are being encouraged upon us are the book of Enoch, uh, the, the apocryphal writings uh, that's in the Catholic Bible um, uh, the gospel according to Thomas the gospel according to Judas the gospel according to Peter the gospel according to Mary uh, a lot of these extra biblical gospels I mean they're all names that we recognize why are they not included in our scriptures things like that we've been talking about for the, the, the previous week we talked about how God's word what the Bible calls God's Word, okay? It doesn't call itself the Bible, per se, right? What does the Bible identify itself as? Go! The Word of God, Scripture, Scriptures, the book, Book of Life, the Good Word, uh, um, the oracles of God, the sacred writings, the, the things like that, right? The Psalms, Proverbs, the law, things like that. So that's what it identified itself as. Then we also looked at that this God himself said that this is so mighty, so powerful. When he breathes it out, it will accomplish what he said it would. Well, is that contingent upon you and me? I mean, were we, were we there having to carry God's words from his mouth to fulfillment when he said, let there be light? Somebody showed up and says, okay, I'll help you here. What can I do? I showed up reporting for duty. Like, no. It doesn't have to be that we have to carry it. God's word will fulfill. It will accomplish. Do we believe that? Okay, according to the word of God, that's what he says. We looked at several different scriptures and how, how this is going to, um, how, how Jesus said, the word of God will endure forever. Remember? Several different places. My words, he said, my words shall endure forever. Um, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away, will by no means pass away. So from Jesus' perspective, it is eternal. Right? Are we okay? I looked at last week in Revelation where it said that the books were open, plural, and then there was one book, the book of life, uh, and then the 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 dead, both small and great, if they're not found in the, the book, singular, the book of life, um, they would be judged by the books. And the books that we're judged by, in that sense, if you're not saved, if you're not you know, in heaven with God, um, if you're not in the book of life, the books that you're going to be judged by are the books of what? Our lives. The record deeds of our lives. Okay. But what is the standard by which we're going to be judged by? The law. The law. Okay? And from the book of Genesis, we see that God wrote a law on, on everyone's heart. We call it today a conscience. 
Well, you know when you're violating your conscience. Okay, everybody knows this. This is kind of universally true. So that being said, um, let's go. I want to ask and I want to endeavor to answer two questions today. Okay, where did the Bible begin? It's a big question. Okay, but to kind of answer that, we're going to have to kind of go back and forth between two concepts. Um, when did writing begin? Okay, are we okay with that? We're going to have to make some outside the scripture uh, assessment on world history and find out if it confirms or denies the scriptures. Okay? Are we okay with that? We can also look in the scriptures and find where writing began. All right? So go with me, if you would, please, to Acts chapter 6. These are very, very important. Chad, would you bring me a water, please? Acts chapter 6. Somebody start with verse 1. 1 through 7. Then we'll have another reader read 8 through 15. 1 through 7. Who's got it? it. All right. Thank you, Chad. Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Timon, Parmenides, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Ephesus, whom they set before the apostles, when they had prayed, they laid hands on him. And the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly, and the wisdom of great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Okay, that's good. Hold on a sec. Three times um, the scriptures are mentioned in this passage. Did you see it? The first time, verse uh, 2, the word of God. Okay, the second time, um, and it was in verse... There you go, teaching the word. So it's called the word. And then the third time, um, verse 7, then the word of God. Again... That's how the scriptures are identifying itself in this sense. Now, why we're reading this passage is because it introduces us to a very important character who has one big blurp on the radar and then his life is extinguished. But what he does and what he says is of paramount value. Okay, so let's go ahead and read somebody verses 8 through 15. Who wants to read that? Jay, go ahead. Cilicia and Asia. Yep, through the rest of the chapter, yep.
Okay, so we have a great big dispute concerning traditions and the scriptures and Jesus. And uh, the key person here is Stephen, Stephen, however you want to call him. Um, and he's standing up and he's being able to, using apologetics, defend the faith. Um, this is important because nobody could stand up against his reasoning. So they sought in to bring in some lies, to discredit him, to put words in his mouth, things like that, things that go on today. So here we have Stephen, and he has the opportunity to address all the people. Listen to this in chapter 7, verse 1. Now pay very close attention. There's some very interesting things. And I love this because this is Stephen giving a quick rundown, a history lesson of the Jewish faith. And consequently, the Christian faith. Are we clear? Okay. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of, our, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, and said to him, Get, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him, uh, God moved him to this land in which we now dwell, you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no ch child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way. Okay, does God speak? Yes, very important we understand that. God speaks. God spoke in this way, that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them for 400 years. Everybody say 400 years. 400 years. In the nation to which they call, or excuse me, to the nation to, to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave, gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs became envious, and they sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all of his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now, verse 11, Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no substance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in, in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. So then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt and died, and he and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamer, the father of Shechem. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied, multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. At this time, here we go. This is where we're getting to. At this time, Moses was born. And was well pleasing to God. And he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, uh, excuse me, but when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. Verse 22. Underline it. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and deeds. What does verse 22 say in yours, Jay? Uh, Moses was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Does anybody have a different translation? I have a question. 
we're asking the question, where did the Bible begin? And when did writing begin? Now, question, according to, to church history, who wrote the book of Genesis? Moses. Okay? He wrote the, 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 the first five books of, of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They're attributed to Moses. These are very important that we understand this. There's a claim that says mo that writing did not exist during Moses' time. Well, when did Moses live? I'm overwhelmed with the response. Pretty early in human history, you'd say, right? Uh, theologians believe between 1526 to 400, uh, 1406 B.C. So in other words, um, 1,500 years before Christ. 1,500 years. That doesn't seem like very long. Well, if you go back at least 400 years, because it was in bondage 400 years, you have the patriarchs. You have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Come on, guys, let's think this thing logically through. 400 years previous, the Bible said, God said they're going to go into bondage for 400 years. So you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were not in bondage. But Jacob's the one who went into Egypt. Then they fell into bondage. Why? Because the Pharaoh said, man, there's too many of these guys. So they started to weed them out, started killing them. Well, that didn't work out very well because they were like, you know, cold winter days or whatever. It was busy, right? They went home and, hey, baby, worked hard today. <laughs> Need a kiss. Leads to a hug. Leads to a baby, a bassinet, right? Well, at any rate, here we have, and the Bible actually says that they were very, um, they took God at his word, be fruitful and multiply. You know, they, let's just, can we, can, we, can we be like that, prolific? Um, so here we have 400 years later, you have the Pharaoh trying to kill the, you know, just population control. And it's not going really well in their favor, but they've really got a foot up on them. Well, here you have Moses who escapes and he does something when he escapes. He's brought up under the Pharaoh's daughter. And how does she treat him? Well, verse 22, look again. In Moses, uh, verse 21, and when, <laughs> but when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. So like Pharaoh's grandson. Okay, the most powerful man in the world. And you're his grandson. That's a good place to be. Okay. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of Egypt. Verse 22. In other words, could you say it like this? He was educated. Private education. This was an, an, an excelled course. This is the, 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 the school of honors. This is not just for everybody. This is for people that, that they're really pouring into. This is the Pharaoh's grandson. I'm not going to have some ignorant little snot-nosed kid running around representing the family. You're going to teach discipline. You're going to teach, you're going to teach this guy. Now, that's kind of funny to me that he would be being taught and they're there is no written language? There's no writing? How does that work? We do know. How? How do we know? Because they're on the walls. Archaeology has showed us of these hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics are one of the oldest forms of writing known to man. That signpost is called the Rosetta Stone. Very important. And, it, and that's exactly kind of how it was. It was, I don't, it was kind of like a signpost. Something that's just like, nah, we need to do something so that people can understand this. And it was written in three, three, four different languages, and hieroglyphics was one of them. And they used the Rosetta Stone to unlock hieroglyphics and how to read and write and understand hieroglyphics. Consequently, if, if hieroglyphics are one of the oldest forms of writing known to man, what is the accepted as the oldest form of writing known to man? 
Come on, guys. Cuneiform. It's called cuneiform. Um, I got pictures of it in here, cuneiform. And it's just, it's very interesting and fascinating. It's, it actually goes way back before Moses. Okay? We'll talk about that in just a moment. I don't want to give away too much. But what we know is in Stephen is addressing the theologians, and nobody disagrees with him. He says Moses was educated. Okay, well, let's go check out some, some things about Moses. We're going to start to have to backtrack. All right, I'm asking and answering the question, where did the Bible begin? Everybody says, well, Moses wrote Genesis, and we accept that. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But question, Genesis ended 400 years before Moses began. So where did he get the, 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 the material for Genesis? Well, if education and reading and writing and arithmetic were something that was a part of Egypt, their culture, then isn't it possible that there was documents in existence when Moses came about? Come on, guys. He had a public library. Is this possible? Not only is it possible, it is, it is accurate. All right? But does the Bible confirm that there was writing in existence before then? Yes. Okay. In written form. Not just Jesus. There's the spoken form. The word, language, but there's a written form. We're looking for writings. Did writings exist before then? That's the question that I'm going to ask. Let's go to Genesis chapter 23. Let's go back to the book of beginnings. Genesis chapter 23. You guys need to see this. Genesis chapter 23. Are we doing okay, guys? We have some amazing things that we want to learn about today. Now, in Genesis chapter 23, this is the story of Abraham. And Abraham, uh, he has had Isaac, and uh, Hagar had Ishmael. Um, we have, let's see, in, in, in uh, chapter 21, you see Isaac is born. We, ha we have Hagar running off, um, you know, and just having, a, have, having kind of a moment, a breakdown. And God speaks to her. He shows up, reveals some things to her. She's, he speaks to her. She comes back. Uh, Ab Abraham has a covenant with Abimelech. Then over in chapter 22, Abraham's faith is confirmed. That's where Abraham is called on by God to go uh, to offer Isaac, his son, on the altar, okay? So, next we have um, chapter 23, Sarah's death and burial, okay? Now this is kind of important, okay? Father Abraham, this is going as far back in our genealogy, so to speak, our, our faith as possible. Abraham, Okay? Now, verse 1 says, Sarah lived 127 years. And these were the life of Sarah. And we skip down to <laughs> verse 7. Somebody want to grab that? Well, let's just let's keep reading verse 2. Somebody grab that. Come on, guys. You got it? Go ahead. Genesis chapter 23, start verse, verse 1 and read down. Give me property for a burial place. 
sign right here that writing was in existence. Where? Give me the story. Give me the story. Give me the rundown. Give me the nutshell version of the, what we just read. Okay, Sarah just died. Abraham's wife. Okay? Abraham's a foreigner in a strange land, and he goes to the guys and says, hey, uh, give me a plot of ground. I'd like to buy a plot of ground to bury my dead. And they said, man, you are like a prince among <coughs> us. You are the, the man. And we're not going to charge you. So take whatever plot you want, and you can have it. And he's like, man, I'm moved. Thank you. However, I'd like to purchase this. And they're going back and forth. <coughs> Finally, the guy's like, listen, it's worth 400 you know, shekel. But what is that to us? It's like, dude, I want to give this to you. And he's saying, no, 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 no. I want to buy this. OK? So the guy says, well, it's worth 400 but I really don't, it's not about the money. I don't want to charge you. And he's like, look, you said 400 here we go. In the presence of everybody, here's 400 Doesn't write a check. He weighs it out. He gives it to the guy. And then what happens? <gasps> Bingo. Did you see it? A deed. <laughs> a deed. All the surrounding borders were deeded to him. What does that mean? That means in our vernacular, a piece of paper, a contract, a deed. What does it mean in Moses' day? Not a piece of paper. Paper doesn't exist. What does it mean in his day, though? It means something to the effect of a scroll, a, a, a block of wood with their signatures on it, or a piece of leather, or, or a stone. Something was created that, that had markings on it that people could understand. And so when Abraham's over there and th th they missed the meeting, okay, the rest of the family wasn't there. Like the cousins didn't show up to the meeting where Abraham's buying this. And Abraham's out there burying his, his wife. And they come up, excuse me, you are trespassing. He says, no, sir, I'm not. I actually own this land. <gasps> no, you don't. Well, yes, I do. Kerkoink. <laughs> Read it, bro. Your uncle signed this. I own this. I bought it. No, 
not just a gift, can't be just taken away. It was purchased. Do you see this? Are you starting to see that even, okay, they say, well, well, writing didn't exist at the time of Moses. That is stupid. That is ignorant. Archaeology has greatly disproved that. The writing existed before Moses. And here we go back more than 400 years, the time of bondage. They go back to Joseph and his father, Jacob, and his father, Isaac, all the way back to his father, Abraham. And Abraham has a written record. So did writing exist in Abraham's day? The answer is yes. Is the Bible showing that? Yes. Did we miss it? Yes. <laughs> Why? Because we wouldn't be arguing this. Well, let's skip over to Genesis chapter 26. We've got to move quickly, guys. Quickly, quickly, quickly. 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 Tell them, Tony. Tell them. Tell them what it's all about. Okay, now this is uh, uh, after the time of after the time of, of Abraham and then Isaac and now it's going starting with verse one uh, to excuse me Isaac uh, verse verse one. Uh, there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac, his son, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Isaac, went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I will tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For you and your descendants I, will, I give all these lands. And... I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father. Now question, who's speaking? God, who's he speaking to? Isaac. This is very important. Here we go. Here comes a huge nugget. Okay. Verse 4. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. Did he tell Abraham that? The stars of heaven, the sands of the you know, shore. I will give to your descendants all of these lands and in your... In, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Again, he's repeating himself to the next generation. Now get ready. Get ready to underline it. Here it is. Because Abraham obeyed my, what? My voice. And he kept my, what? My charge. My commandments my statutes, and my laws. What did Moses, or excuse me, what did, what did Abraham keep? His charge. He obeyed his voice. He obeyed his voice. That's not written. But the indication is, what is the charge? That's part of the voice. But his commandments, his statutes, and his laws... That's going beyond just a, a, a verbal. That's getting into something that God is appealing to, to Isaac, saying, your father obeyed my word. What word? Commandments. Whoa. This is Father Abraham we're talking about. This is like 500, 600 years before the law was given. The Ten Commandments, Moses... So God's calling Isaac, saying, your daddy followed a code. Some statutes. Some commandments. In other words, during Abraham's lifetime, something was written about God. Do, do you see this? Do you understand this? Those commands, I believe, are found in Genesis, before Genesis 11. It's actually around verse 9, uh, nine, nine or, or chapter 9, ver, you know, chapter 10. Um, chapter, Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. You have the first commands outside of the Garden of Eden. Now, these are commands, not the first time God is speaking. These are the first commands given to Noah. 
immediately after the flood. And you can read about it. God says, do this, do this, don't do this. Absolutely avoid this. There's something being given to Noah that is somehow transmitted to all the way to Abraham's day. Now, this is important. Did writing exist before Moses? Uh, Yeah, I think we pretty well clearly established that. Let's go back to Abraham. Did writing exist during Abraham's day? The answer is... Uh, very clearly yes well it's appealing to some laws god is telling isaac hey listen your father followed my laws my rules my 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 statutes my commandments he's appealing to something well you can start to see evidence of that at noah's time well now you have what archaeology has shown to be cuneiform which actually predates the flood So I'm going to ask the question, and I don't really have time to develop an answer, but when, okay, uh, the question are twofold. When did the Bible begin? Well, in the beginning. No, no, when did, let's ask the second question. When did writing begin? Question, was it through Noah? No, it appears with Noah, but did it begin with Noah? No, archaeology has proven that it actually predated Noah. So let me ask a question. What is writing? Yeah, it, you could go with that. I'll go with that. I'll buy it. What else is it? Let me, let me, let me kind of help you see it like this. If I could write something down, which I have here, I can express... In a medium that's not alive, not living, paper's dead. Okay? I can express thoughts, ideas, my heart. I can express it to somebody else. In my absence, they can now see and understand my heart. So, in essence, when I write something, I'm communicating non verbally. Okay? Text message, email, a letter in the mail. I'm communicating non-verbally something. Here it is. What am I communicating? A thought, an idea, um, my heart, a directive, a command. If that's what writing is, then where did it begin? Because this would be revolutionary. Because in Jay's absence... Okay, Jay says, hey, Pastor Jimmy, I'm going to come in and clean the church on Saturday. Great, but I wasn't here when he said that. So he told that to somebody else, and they're like, hey, Jay's going to come in and clean. When? Not really sure, but it's going to be this week, I'm sure. You know, we got Sunday, you know, church on Sunday. Okay, great. Well, as long as it's not Saturday, we're great because we're having a wedding here on Saturday. Right? Well, then, whoopsie, we have a collapse of information. Are you seeing this? So when Jay writes it down, he can clearly communicate clearly and express himself clearly in his absence. So he doesn't have to call me up every 10 minutes and say, hey, you know, I'm going to be there Saturday. Don't forget, you know, Saturday, right? So then my question to you is, where did this begin? in world history and the answer is with Cain Adam and Eve Cain and Abel okay second generation what are you saying pastor writing began with Cain how is that possible okay again if we define what writing is is to convey a thought or an idea through something written or a symbol given um, whether it's on stone, on leather, on a piece of wood, on a piece of paper or papyrus or whatever, it's to be able to communicate an idea or a thought. Question, what happened after Cain killed Abel? Boom! He did what? He marked him. He put a mark on him. 
What was the mark? I don't know, but it was unique to him. Some people say, some people that are prejudiced, and I don't appreciate this, they say, well, God made him black. Really? That's not what the Bible says. Because what about his kids? Is that, that mark on his kids too? Because the Bible says it was for Cain, not his descendants, not an entire race. It's all one race, the human race. So saying that, well, God made Cain black, you're dumb. Okay? What did he do? He marked him somehow. It was not a birthmark because it was after. He's an adult. He made a bad decision. He murdered his brother. What was the idea, the mark to convey? Don't kill this man. Uh, signed, God. Okay? Is it therefore possible then to deduce rationally, reasonably, that it was God who invented writing on the second generation and it was picked up rather quickly thereafter by humankind saying, this would make sense if we had some kind of deed or written record Proof positive that written records were ex in existence. There's 11 accounts in the book of Genesis. They're called genealogies. What is that? That's who begot who, 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 who, begot who and yeah. And that's a written record. And it all, it goes all the way back to who? Adam. So where did writing begin? I believe, logically and rationally, that you can advocate a case for the second generation of humankind on this earth with Cain from God. I believe that you can advocate that. I believe that you have bib strong biblical. I believe that you can see in the scriptures in the book of Genesis that writing was in existence. Okay? Now, archaeology outside the scriptures actually confirms what I'm telling you. Cuneiform predates the flood. So, all right, we're out of time, way over time. God bless you. I hope you'll be back next Sunday.